Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. I am Valentin Fuster from New York, and here we are in the beautiful city of Munich, attending the European Society of Cardiology meeting. As usual, we are going to have one hour of discussion of what we consider are the most interesting uh, uh, breaking trials that have been presented at this meeting. And as usual, I am surrounded by real experts in different fields who will help us to really digest what has been going on. And today, actually, we are going to be presenting uh, nine studies here. So uh, I hope we can, we can be brief, each of us, and, and, and certainly have a discussion to the point. Well, I'd like to introduce my colleagues. All are professors, so I don't have to start talking about <laughs> academic positions. But uh, Dr. Gilles Montalescott, the director of the cardiac care unit at the PTA Salpetriere Hospital in Paris. You know Dr. Deepak Bhatt, executive director of interventional cardiology programs at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And then here in my left, Dr. Irina Savelieva is the um, division of cardiac and vascular sciences at St. George's University uh, in the United Kingdom, in London. And finally, here on my left, uh, Dr. Michael Borger, Director of Cardiac Surgery, University Hospital in Leipzig Heart Center here in Germany. Well, we have uh, to provide first with an appetizer. What that means, I will tell you what we are going to be discussing. Nine studies. We'll start with three interventional surgical studies, the culprit shock, patients with myocardial infarction and shock, low risk stubber, aortic valve replacement percutaneously in patients at low risk, very interesting. And then the, what we do for secondary mitral regurgitation in patients who are actually sick. Should we do a mitral clip? Should we follow this patient medically? So these are three studies that were presented in this meeting. Then the meeting got aspirinated. We have a number of papers. The aspirin is one of the players. First, the, the validation of the dual antiplatelet therapy score, or the DAP validation. Second is the global leaders, uh, and that is the is Tecagalor really pretty good when we use uh, antiplatelet therapy following stenting? Could we use it alone? Very interesting. Then we have the diabetic patient. It's a high-risk patient. And the question is, should this patient receive aspirin? This is the ascent study. And there's another ascent study. Should we give you omega-3 if you are diabetic, Jills? We'll see what happens. <laughs> All right, we'll discuss it. Then we have arrived. What about patients who have moderate risk for coronary artery disease? Should we give these patients aspirin? And finally, a fascinating study, uh, ATTR amyloid. Do we have any drug that can actually prolong life in these patients? Certainly, we didn't have it until three days ago. Let's see what happened in this meeting. So we're going to start uh, one by one, and we'll begin with the three papers that um, is a mixture of intervention and surgery. Well, here we are on the first paper, the culprit shock. Uh, deep, I, I remember this story a little bit. Uh, when we began to see papers that in patients with acute myocardial infarction and multivessel disease, perhaps was better to revascularize totally, not only the culprit lesion, but also the other lesions that were significant. And actually, this came out in the guidelines. Mm -hmm. Everybody appeared to be moving in that direction. And all of a sudden, right. we have the group that are presenting the paper today, one year follow-up. They have the data at 30 days of follow-up. It just didn't work so well. So guidelines were then changed. They went back. You should not do it. And now we have, well, maybe let's wait for a year. The results of the culprit shock were bad at one month, but what happened at one year? So let's, let's go into the study. In fact, the, um, the culprit shock was presented by Dr. Thiel, 
from the University of Leipzig. You may know him. Yes. <laughs> and actually, the question here uh, is quite fascinating. We are dealing with over 700 patients that actually um, um, were entered into the study either with a culprit lesion only, PCI, or immediate multivessel PCI. The primary endpoint, death or renal replacement therapy at 30 days. This was already presented, but we will recapitulate in a moment. Uh, Pre-specified second, uh, secondary endpoints at one year included death from any cause, recurrent myocardial infarction, repeat revascularization, rehospitalization for congestive heart failure. Well, let's see actually what happened. At 30 days, and we already know this data, the, um, the patients um, who were treated with single, um, just addressing only the culprit lesion, the primary endpoint occurred in 45% of these patients, where if the, all the lesions were approached, was close to 55%. So let's remember about 10 points of difference in favor of being much more conservative in doing PCI of the culprit lesion. So what happened in one year? Making the long story short, that gap in mortality decreased a little bit into six points of difference. So a little bit better than that 30 days, but still there is a difference in mortality. And then what, um, what actually I, find, I found interesting, the repeat revascularization uh, and rehospitalization was significantly higher in the group that was treated only on the uh, culprit lesion. So in the conclusion of this paper that was published uh, simultaneously in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of days ago, the conclusions are as follows. Among patients with acute myocardial infarction and cardiogenic shock, the risk of death or renal replacement therapy at 30 days was lower with culprit lesion only. And mortality did not differ significantly between the two groups at one year of follow-up. We talk about mortality six points of difference compared with 10 points at 30 days. So let me ask you, Deepak, you are going to have tomorrow a patient in your cath lab with three vessel disease, and the patient is in shock. What are you going to do? I'm going to follow the study. So it's very different than my preconceived beliefs. That sort of patient with multivessel disease, maybe the LAD is occluded. That's the culprit lesion, but there's a 90% mid-RCA, 80% uh, distal circ. If they were in shock, my practice had been to open it all up. Of course, do the LAD culprit first, but then go after the other lesions in the belief that that was going to help that patient in shock by perhaps perfusing the sort of uh, border zones of ischemia. It made lots of sense. There was lots of observational data that supported it, uh, even some uh, analyses out of randomized data sets. So it's what I did. It's what most of my colleagues were doing. But, you know, here's a well-done randomized clinical trial. The 30-day endpoint was quite <clears throat> definitive. And even at a year, mortality is still going in the wrong direction. That is, it's still favoring the culprit-only strategy. So moving forward, what I'm going to do is treat that LAD lesion. And then the other two lesions, I'm going to resist temptation, leave them alone in the middle of the night as I'm dealing with this sick shock patient. And then tomorrow or the next day, if I need to bring them back because they're not doing well, I'll do so. From all the previous studies, most of them actually were multivessel disease, but not patients in shock. I only know one study was a registry that was not randomized, pointing out that perhaps doing everything was better, but was a registry. Is not correct? Yes, but this is a, a different situation. These patients are in shock, and yeah. uh, if you go into trouble in the middle of your PCI on the, on the contral lateral artery, the, the patient is going to die. Uh, but, Jules, there is, there is one, one issue I want to be very sure. The patient I just presented, uh, Deepak, is now has three vessel disease and is not in shock. This study is not answering that question. What would you do? If he's not in shock, and uh, uh, I think it's uh, um, easy lesions to treat in, in the same setting, yeah. I would probably do it, uh, just to avoid another trip to the patient, uh, to, 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 to the cat lab. Uh, in, in, in shock, uh, uh, I would resist uh, the temptation, of course, uh, yeah. and, and the patient would come back to the cat lab for the next lesions. And there is one more thing which is, uh, I think, interesting in this paper, is that these pa patients uh, in, the, in the group 
where we have the, the culprit uh, uh, lesion only treated had more uh, heart failure. Uh, and and the, the difference was significant. And I think this is because most of these patients survived initially and they had heart yeah. failure later. Um, uh, but this is quite interesting. The, the survivors uh, had more heart failure in the good group of this study. Yeah, Dr. Borges, what do you think about all of this? As a surgeon, are you watching these guys, what they are doing right or wrong? <laughs> yeah, of, of course. You know, Holger Thieler, the, the first author, is a friend and colleague of mine. And um, it seems like a logical strategy to me for people that are in shock because they have multi-organ problems and um, more uh, uh, contrast dye load is obviously going to have some effects on the kidney that are not such an issue for patients that are not in shock. And the heart failure, the increased heart failure may be just that the people that wouldn't have survived before are surviving. And that's why you, you may, may be an explanation why you have more heart failure in the culprit lesion uh, group. Uh, for, for me, the re increased repeat re revascularization is not necessarily a bad thing because it's in the whole picture a, a, a staged approach to the patient. And that to me physiologically makes sense. Irina, I have a question. Uh... You know, um, I reviewed the previous paper, there was a registry, you know, and in patients with shock, and it appeared to be positive. And here we have a randomized trial. So it's just for to, to, to really elaborate into the difference between registries and observational studies and, and, and trials that are done properly. Well, exactly. That's uh, the usual problem. We have a registry or observational cohort study and we receive positive results. We perform randomized controlled trial and the results are somewhat different. And now we are facing the problem of interpreting these results, interpreting these results. I actually would like probably to, I uh, would be more interested in looking at the subgroup of these patients because even if it is a shock patient, they are not the same. So there would be patients uh, for whom more extensive intervention would be possible on the day. So I would be interested in identifying yeah. specific subsetting within this mm -hmm. one particular uh, situation um, based on the results of this trial and including the registry results, whether we can tease out that someone could the be treated. The question is going to be whether other trials will be possible to be carried out here after the results of this study, but you are, you are absolutely correct. Maybe going back to this same study, maybe some, some subgroups could be elicited. Yeah, that's what's uh, I mean, you've got to give needs. credit to these investigators because it's tough to enroll shock patients yeah. in yeah. a randomized clinical yeah. trial. It is very difficult to recruit these patients, very of difficult. course, and yeah. to repeat these studies. It's uh, Okay, so uh, this study is changing our minds of how to treat patients with acute myocardial infarction and shock. Now comes a second paper, very interesting. We all have been thinking about when Tabar started, you know, everybody was saying, well, we'll see what happened. And it started with patients who were not candidates for surgery, very sick patients. Then randomized studies, candidates for surgery, but with high scores, uh, risk scores. And now we are moving more and more into patients with aortic valvular stenosis, in which, in fact, their risk is not so high. And this is an interesting paper uh, presented in this meeting that I would like to um, discuss with you. Well, basically, um, the studies, the so-called LRT study, or low-risk TAVR study, uh, that was presented by Dr. Ron uh, Waxman from the Metastar Washington Hospital Center in Washington, D.C. So let's go into uh, the study in itself. Um, and the first thing is, who were these patients? Well, basically, the study involved uh, 200 patients that we are told were low risk with aortic valvular stenosis. Importantly, they all had significant symptomatology. But when they look at the risk, the risk score, the STS score was equal or less than 3%, which is pretty low, isn't it? Well, this is the type of patients we are talking about. Now, this group of 200 were compared historically, uh, these 200 patients came from 11 centers, by the way, uh, 
uh, were compared historically from uh, over 700 patients that underwent SABR or, or surgical aortic valve replacement at a single institution with the same STS score. So this is the type of comparison. It's not a randomized study, so I would really pay much more attention on the description of what happened with these patients that had TAVR, that just with the comparison in itself. Well, the data here is at 30 days of follow-up. Zero all-cause mortality uh, in the TAVR group. Then they mentioned the surgical group was, was 1.7. Zero in hospital stroke, interestingly. Permanent pacemaker implantation were similar in this group, 5% versus 4.5% in the surgical group. The rates of new onset of, of um, atrial fibrillation uh, were actually low, was 3%. And then finally, uh, in terms of perivalvular or paravalvular leak, only one patient out of the 200. Uh, but, uh, you know, some concern here. 14% of the patients had evidence at CT of subclinical leaflet thrombosis at 30 days. So uh, the summary of this paper that was just published in Jack uh, actually yesterday is that TAVR is safe in low-risk patients with symptomatic CV aortic stenosis with low procedural complication rates, short hospital length of stay, zero mortality, and zero disabling stroke at 30 days. Subclinical leaflet thrombosis was observed in a minority of TAVR patients at 30 days. Dr. Borgia, what do you think about this? How, how, how do you digest this type of information and, as a surgeon? Well, it's very important for us because 80% of our patients are low risk, SDS less than 4%. Um, and this is very interesting data. It's very different than a meta-analysis which was just published uh, by Wittberg um, with, with six uh, studies, two randomized and four um, propensity matched analysis. And in that bigger cohort, they had much higher pacemaker rates than the surgical patients, uh, higher paravalvular leak rates, but lower kidney uh, uh, failure and, and lower atrial fibrillation. But interestingly, they also had higher mortality, statistically significant higher mortality at two years after the procedure, the TAVR group. So that is in complete contrast to what we're seeing here. So, but this is early data. And what I would say is this is interesting data, but let's wait for the five big randomized trials that are ongoing right now across the world. And that's really where we're, we're going to be. That, that will really be interesting then when that data comes out. Irina, it bothers you, the thrombosis aspect of the leaflets? 14%. Um, yes, that's um, a bit of an unexpected finding at su such short interval. But also, I have a little bit of a problem when we're using historical cohorts. Yeah. Historical data mm. taken from different time, from different institutions, in attempt to uh, mimic the randomized control trial. Um, and these patients, no matter how well they're matched, they're different patients. So really, it yeah, sometimes is it is, um, you know, the purpose of this paper is to compare with surgical outcomes. It's a descriptive and it's paper, I would call patients. it. Yeah. 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 But I think that what this paper shows that certainly the technique is improving. Mm -hmm. We started reporting 10% of permanent pacemaker implants in these patients. Obviously, now it's down. It's a low risk. A group, of course, but now to five percent. Yeah. So, certainly, outcomes are getting better, and to some extent, that's an important, a good piece of information. But it is additive. Thank you, Jules. How do you react? Are we going to be doing this procedure in younger people? Because what is really, as we move less risk population. I'm just worried about bicuspid aortic valves coming in uh, in their 40s, in their 50s. T t tell me, what, what is your feeling about the field? I, I think it's very tempting. Uh, and, and the patients are asking for uh, less aggressive procedures, including when they are at low risk. So uh, it makes sense to have the discussion. 
as a doctor, of course, it's, uh, uh, it, it makes sense to have a, a low-risk procedure in a high-risk patient. But having a, a, a low-risk procedure in a low-risk patient is a different situation. And I think we, we uh, really need hard data from randomized studies to know if this is the right thing to do. But I can tell you, patients are already asking yeah. for that. Yeah, Deepak? Well, uh, I've got to be careful what I say. There's a surgeon sitting across from me. But I, I was really excited by this study. I think the results really look good uh, with the caveats that people mentioned. And Gilles is right. The patients want it. The interventionists want to do it. Uh, so there's a lot of momentum here. But stepping back from that excitement, I think we have to respect the fact that there are multiple ongoing randomized clinical trials. We really need to wait for that larger randomized data set. And most importantly, we need longer term follow-up. The question isn't really, can you take a young, healthy person and put a tavern in? Surely you can, and the results will be pretty good for the procedure, but the real question is five years down the road, 10 years down the road, the what's the durability? Yeah. Does the subclinical leaflet thrombosis issue, does it matter or not? And, and Gilles is leading a trial to, to help decide, should we anticoagulate these right. folks? What do we do with them? Until mm -hmm. those answers are in, I'd actually be nervous that people like me will get too excited by these results uh, instead of just taking that young, healthy person who's got AS and sending them to the surgeon. Yeah, I think it's a good summary. One has to get a little bit nervous about this whole field at this moment until we have long-term follow-up studies. Okay, so here we have a challenge, and it's the third paper I would like to have your opinion. Um, you know, secondary mitral regurgitation. Um, I don't know, my feeling about uh, mitral regurgitation, like following myocardial infarction and so forth, it depends, frankly, how sick the patient is. I mean, going back to my experience, uh, to operate at a patient like this with low ejection fraction, the, the possibility of success is very small because the natural history is not good. But anyway, let's discuss it. Let's, let's get into the paper that was presented in this meeting. It's called the Mitra FR Investigators uh, uh, Group, who presented a paper which was published again in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, yesterday, a couple of days ago, and is percutaneous repair or medical treatment for secondary mitral regurgitation. Dr. Obedia um, from the, um, from the Bronze Cedex in France, and I think it's, near, it's an area near Lyon, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, presented the paper, and I would like to go over, perhaps in, in some detail. So uh, they randomized uh, patients with severe secondary mitral regurgitation, in fact, was severe indeed. Effective regurgitant orifice area was more than 20 square millimeters in a regurgitant volume of more than 30 milliliters per beat. 11 regurgitation fraction between 15 and 40 percent. So these really were sick people. And certainly they, they were significantly uh, symptomatic. And then what they did is uh, 122 of uh, 152 of these patients. Uh, underwent um, mitral clip, and the other 152 uh, underwent actually uh, just medical therapy. Uh, I think the study actually, if I recall, was a French study. It was, was yes. just confined to France, isn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, here we have the endpoints, uh, obviously composite of death from any cause or unplanned hospitalization for heart failure at 12 months. So we are dealing with a about a year of follow-up. No difference in anything between medical therapy and, and this approach. But I was uh, particularly taken because with this primary endpoint, with composite of death or hospitalization, we are dealing with figures of 44%, 54%, pretty high. These are sick people. Uh, with the rate of death about 24%. And in hospitalization, 48%. So I think the paper, uh, frankly, has value, but the value, as I see, and I really like your opinion now, is that maybe we are getting here too late, and maybe earlier would be better. I'd like to hear what is your opinion, Jill, about this, because this is going to have significant repercussions, because we have these patients all the time, and we don't know what to do with them. Yes, you're correct, and, and uh, I keep in mind a few of these patients uh, very much improved by the intervention. 
and you think this is the right way to, to, to go. But when you look at the study, globally there is uh, absolutely no impact of this uh, intervention. Maybe these patients were too sick, maybe uh, the intervention went too late in the course of the disease, but it's also a challenge to say we have a procedure to reduce mitral insufficiency in these type of patients. For years and years, we have treated patients medically, yeah. uh, uh, knowing that the underlying disease is, is the main reason for, for, for the symptoms. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I'm not saying that uh, um, mitral clip is dead for uh, this type of mitral insufficiency, but I think we, we need more studies to know who are the right patients for this type of intervention. If I recall, Deepak, uh, a number of European studies that got into this type of patients, they improved symptomatically, though. But here's a randomized study, I think is the right study. I'd like to know your opinion about it. I agree with you. I think it's a well-done study. It's randomized. Honestly, I was disappointed, but I think it's always useful to get information, even if the answer is negative. Now, with this sort of study, predictably, there were some interventionalists that, you know, blamed the operators and said, oh, in my hands, mitral clips better, but, you know, they weren't so good. Other people, you know, blamed the patients, say, well, patients are too sick. But the reality is, in this population where people were really, at least some people were thinking mitral clip would really shine, you know, it didn't. Uh, now, there is another randomized clinical trial that will be presented in a couple of months, mm -hmm. uh, the COAP trial, so there's going right. to be another uh, chance to take a look at this. And if that comes back positive, then we'll be in a real dilemma. But, you know, for the time being, I, I think Gilles is right. A lot of times these left ventricles are blown, they're dilated. Yeah. That, that's the real problem. And fixing the mitral regurg is just, you know, too little, too late. It's pretty late, Irina. Yeah, I think that uh, to follow this point, I think that's probably true for all valvular disease patients, that we intervene a little bit too late. Mm -hmm beyond the point of reversibility, when radical intervention would really have a big impact. So, and maybe this reflected in this subset of patients that we tried to correct the uh, pathology far too late when the intervention may not work as we would hope and would expect, because I also was a little bit surprised at lack of yeah. difference with medical therapy. Intuitively, you would expect it to go the other way. I'd like to ask you, Michael, from a surgical perspective, uh, I remember surgeons approaching such patients not too long ago. How, how do you think things have changed here? I just say, I, I would say that we're re reinventing the wheel here. We, we unfortunately already discovered this in surgery. We all yeah. listened to Steve Bowling back then, and we operated on these patients thinking, oh, yeah, this is a great operation. And we were severely disappointed with the outcomes. And we essentially stopped this surgery. And um, again, it's the same lesson. I, the primary determinant of the patient's outcome is, the, is their ventricle and their comorbidities and not the mitral valve which brings into question a whole industry that has now arisen based on mitral valve therapy for uh, functional mitral regurgitation. So this, this paper is really a, a threat to a lot of people out there, but it confirms what I as a clinician have already experienced. And to blame the operators I don't think is valid because their MR reduction rate at discharge was extremely good, extremely good. So that they weren't able to demonstrate a, de a decrease in rehospitalization for heart failure was a, a, a big blow, and we have to we, we have to wait for these other randomized trials, and to see what 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 the future is for this type of therapy. But I think that this trial leads us perfectly into a sham study because uh, a sham randomized trial. I know that's a very hot topic, but this is a beautiful setup for it because patients, of course, they feel better after an intervention. Yeah, right. Well, anyway, we, we had already discussed three interventional surgical studies. We said no to two of them, the culprit <laughs> shock, no to extended uh, PCI, uh, mitral click in significant secondary mitral regurgitation with low ejection fraction, we said no. And then we are cautious about the low risk tower. And that's maybe the summary of the first three trials that we came here. Now we are going to get into uh, a number of, of trials with aspirin and, and ticagrelor and so forth. But I'd like to start 
with um, one study that to me is fascinating, uh, maybe not to you, but uh, it came up in Jack actually, I think today or yesterday. And it's the so-called related to the dual antiplatelet therapy score system. And let me give a little bit of background uh, with this score system. When the DAPT study that was generated actually in your institution, uh, Deepak, uh, came out, um, this all led to a number of score systems in time to predict who should be treated long term with dual antiplatelet therapy more than a year and who should not. And basically, the score, if I recall, was uh, sicker is the patient, more you have to move into dual antiplatelet therapy. Patients with acute MI and undergoing a stenting, uh, saphenous vein graft undergoing a stenting, uh, small diameters, I remember that, and then significant comorbidities, I don't know, renal failure, respiratory failure, and then risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, tobacco, all of this was pulled together into a score system, and if I recall, I think more than two points meant you have to, to give patient antiplatelet therapy, uh, certainly for more than a year, and if it was a score that was low, it would be less. All was very nice, but the, here's the problem with all these scoring systems. First of all, the stents used at that time were actually um, were uh, more of the older stents that they are used today, that's number one. Number two, the, the, data, the studies were not validated. It's a single study that was not validated by other studies, and those who tried to validate were short-term. So, in fact, there's a big gap between the score that came from that very well-done study, by the way, and what is going on today. So the Swedish decided to have a look on their fantastic registry that they have, you know, and, uh, and it's interesting. Uh, this study is based on the, on the Swedish registry with significant uh, number of patients, actually 41,000 patients uh, that were registered. And, um, and they had uh, DAPT, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, for 12 months. And then what happened after 12 months, basically they wanted to look at the score of DAPT, see if it worked on predictability. That's basically what they did. So what they compared is the original formula of, uh, of DAPT with what they found. And the way they are analyzed this, is statistically speaking, is important. Uh, the so-called uh, C-statistic, which is the score for discrimination and the score for calibration. I think this is very interesting. The score for discrimination is the C-score, that basically what it looks as, if you have a given individual, can you predict will have the event or not? And that's as simple as that. And there is a C-score, and ideal is to have a C-score of 1. If you have a C-score of 0 0.5, 0 0.6, is bad news. This is not working. And the second is, as you have a score system, higher is the risk, higher will be the number of events. So there is a parallelism. So the calibration score means there is a parallelism. Well, let me give you the results. Nothing worked here. The calibration score was 0 0.56 and was a U-wave, so there's no kind of parallelism. And the question that I'm going to ask you, what went wrong here is that scores, there are 300 score systems today, were wrong, or the study are different stands at that time that they are now. And Gilles, I will ask you first, um, just give me a sense, because I am tired of his course, by the way. I, even I, I, wrote, a, I wrote an editorial <laughs> about it. But anyway, let's, let's listen to you. You, you know, we have, we have now books of scores in cardiology. So we have so many scores that nobody uh, uh, uses them most, most of the time. But here, this is a, an interesting study because the size is, is such that you can look at a, a, a population of coronary patients and test the score. But the situation is very different from the randomized study, where you had one group not treated. Here, everybody is being treated as the physicians want to treat the, the patient. So it, it, I think it's very difficult to adjust for the prolongation or not of treatment in such a population. They, they try to do it, but uh, uh, they don't have a control arm just like you have it in, in the randomized study. Mm -hmm. And now the values uh, of the C statistics are so low, it's just a toss of a coin. 
So uh, it, it does not give confidence to use a DAPD score to take the decision to prolong or not. That, that's the, 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 the main conclusion of the, of the study. And I think many physicians will feel confident to, to follow this conclusion because they are lazy or they don't like the scores, but most of them say they, they don't use scores. Yeah. Deepak? Yeah, I've got to make a confession. I don't use any risk scores in clinical practice. Well, we are already three of us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I think they're interesting. I, I, I've participated in several. It makes for good papers, you know, but, yeah, but, but in terms of clinical practice, when you have an individual is, patient, it doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't really work. And, and, and the problem with many risk scores, including ones I've participated in, is that they aren't <clears throat> validated in multiple populations before use. You've got to validate in multiple different uh, real world populations different regions, different ethnicities, uh, both sexes, obviously. And, and unless that's done, it, it's impossible to apply them in real life. And, and very few risk scores ever meet that bar. Irina, are you a score person? I think, uh, yeah, I um, probably agree that good scores are very useful for clinicians just to uniform their practice. Because if we all go uh, uh, following our gut feeling is a good thing, but we need some evidence-based uh, uh, risk stratification. Can I challenge But not that? all scores will work, <laughs> I agree. And evaluation of scores is very difficult validation. National databases like this big numbers as immediately will blow us, you know, like, oh my God, that's a huge big data. But they are not complete. They are not that great because there is no much incentive in entering yeah. all information. And God knows how yeah. many events were simply missed. So we have to take this big registry data not prospective registries, uh, controlled registries with a pinch of salt. Common. Yeah, it's a good point you raise about evidence-based medicine, but we don't actually apply evidence-based medicine to risk scores. That is the right thing to do with a risk score beyond validating its ability to determine risk. That's important and rarely done. But even if that's done, what really needs to happen is randomization to risk score versus standard of care yes. to see if it actually improves yes. outcomes. Because if it doesn't improve outcomes, just the fact that it detects risk, you know, it's interesting, but it's not actionable. Yeah. I would just say the nice thing is that you get these whole integers, and so it kind of gives you a, a sign to each of the variables, which gives you a sort of a rough idea of how important those variables are. So as a clinician, that may be of some value, but I think most clinicians already know approximately which risk factors are more important than the other ones. And I know of no surgeon that, that sits and calculates these scores. <laughs> okay. Four against one. <laughs> <laughs> there are good things in some, you know, the STS score, for example. Yes. You, at least you can, when you, when you enter groups of patients, you know, at least what kind of an uh, individual you're dealing with, so... A good score is a good thing. Okay, good. A bad good. score is All right. a word. You, you made it. <laughs> All right, look, we are going now into... Uh, this was the... Now let's get into the aspirin take Agalor. Well, the next paper is called Global Leaders. Actually, you wrote the editorial about this paper. If I read you the title uh, that appeared in The Lancet, you will not understand a thing. <laughs> <laughs> There's a title with 50 words, and uh, I'm, I'm going to avoid it. <laughs> but l let me tell you how I see, and you correct me. This is a trial that I think they tried to look at whether ticagrelor alone can have an impact in patients following stenting. I think that was probably the driving force. And, and, uh, and this study actually is 18 countries, 130 sites. And the way the study was done is as follows. First, a group was called experimental, uh, was a standard. And the standard group is the patient undergoes stenting and then uh, has aspirin and tetracycline for 12 months. And after 12 months, this, pa this patient goes on aspirin alone. The dose of aspirin, 75 to 100 milligrams. And tetracycline was actually either 90 milligrams twice daily if it was an acute coronary syndrome when they put the stent, or, or, or 90 milligrams as a single dose if it was a stable disease. 
This is the um, this is the standard group, and then the experimental group basically is one month of dual antiplatelet therapy, and then they continue ticagrelor for 24 months. Um, and the question is, what happened when you compare these two groups? Nothing. <laughs> no difference. And now I can go into the primary endpoint, uh, two, two years, composite all-cause mortality, non-fatal uh, myocardial infarction, uh, secondary endpoints about bleeding. Each of them, there was no difference at all. And you wrote the editorial comment, uh, Deepak. Maybe you have uh, something to say about it, but, but, uh, but it's interesting. I think it's a well-done study, is not correct? Oh, I agree. I've got to congratulate the investigators. They did an outstanding job. It was an interesting question, uh, but as it turns out, you know, the hypothesis was wrong. That's okay in clinical trials. Well-done studies are usually, you know, negative. And, you know, here it's not that there was harm, per se, with this strategy. It's just that there wasn't any statistically significant benefit. And I think, in a sense, that's good news. As I titled the editorial, you know, aspirin remains the global leader in antiplatelet therapy. And that's good, because aspirin is cheap. It's yeah. once a day unlike ticagrelor, which is twice a day. Uh, few patients will have dyspnea on ticagrelor. It's not an issue with aspirin. So cheaper or less side effects, better adherence as well with uh, aspirin versus ticagrelor monotherapy. So I think it's a win for aspirin, and we should keep doing what we're doing. You make two comments in the editorial, which I think is looking at... I'm tired of this dual antiplatelet therapy. I'm <laughs> sorry to say that, but it's like a paper every week, and uh, it's just... Uh, but you make a comment, and that is where this field is going, and, uh, and what is going, I believe, is shorter and shorter antithrombotic therapy. But I am very intrigued by the combinations of a platelet inhibitor and NOAX, because these patients have coronary artery disease, and NOAX are beginning to make noise right. in coronary artery disease. And I'd like to know your opinion, or at least your perspective of this dual antiplatelet therapy. You have done so much on this, but give us a capsule report of where your head is in the future. Oh, d d difficult to say, but um, um, these investigators were very unlucky. When you look at uh, the table three, I think, in, in the paper, there are 20 endpoints and none of them is significant. Yeah. Even by chance, you should have one or two, but, but none of them were significant. So the, 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 the hypothesis is really um, uh, uh, not, not verified here. So, um, yes, we go to shorter duration of treatments with DAPT, whatever it is, uh, except probably in the very high-risk patients. And, and we have data out there, just like Pigas is suggesting that we may have some benefit in, in some patient of prolonging treatment, especially when they have a prior MI. And, and, and the NOACs, low doses of NOACs have been tested successfully in secondary prevention. It works uh, well in CAD patients. It works even better in PAD patients. Yeah. So it works probably uh, even better in patients with both CAD and PAD. So we will probably target this kind of patients to start off with this combination of a low dose NOAC with aspirin, with aspirin, not another, not another one. Aspirin is still there, and uh, uh, we we will be very vigilant on safety because, of course, there is a risk of bleeding, which increases with this uh, kind of strategy. I am intrigued by one question about the NOAC. Dosages that we are talking about in coronary disease are pretty low. This means that these anticoagulants perhaps work at lower dose in the arterial system versus when you have a left atrium that is large with atrial fibrillation, you need a larger dose, you think it's... It may, because one gets the impression that the low dose really works more for arterial disease than, than atrial fibrillation, just a... I, I, I think this is uh, true. You want to control thrombin generation in stable patients who are living their life out there, and, and you don't need uh, high doses. And, uh, and, and, and we have to keep in mind that uh, uh, we, we, we had the same thing in the past with um, low molecular weight binds. The low doses were better than the high doses. Yeah. So uh, it's uh, a repeating story. Yeah. So, Irina, what do you think about this uh, enterprise, the Carlor versus? Well, I think that uh, this trial was inspired by two previous uh, relatively small sized trials, like Wust, one of those that found that monotherapy or taking aspirin away uh, actually works as well as monotherapy. And uh, 
with the benefit of a new generation, Taikagri law people did expect uh, mm -hmm. better results, some improvement. But uh, the trial is neutral, so effectively it may give you an idea that you could go for standard care, what you are accustomed to, it's, it works, it's not associated with any harm compared with a different arm on, or you can try and uh, um, use uh, uh, newer strategies, though it won't be probably very convincing for many physicians and uh, yeah. standard care. Deep and uh, they did actually, the first months, Tyker and aspirin, uh, instead of just going for monotherapy with Tyker in the first, in, in the Tyker monotherapy arm, that also, I don't know what your, you can make out of this, but uh, why did they, um, Designed the trial in this way. It was, a, it was not an inferiority trial, isn't it? It, it wasn't. It, it, it but would it be seems challenging, be. though. That's a great question. It's challenging because an open label trial. So and it has two different aspects uh, t that are different in the arms. That is, it's one month of DAPT in the one arm and yeah. 12 months of DAPT in the other. And in that 12 months, if you're a stable stented patient, it's aspirin and clopidogrel. And if you're an ACS stented patient, it's aspirin and ticaglor. So there are lots of differences. And in an open label trial, multiple differences between the two arms, I think it would be hard to claim non-inferiority. Yeah. And the challenge is, again, with aspirin, it's cheaper, easier to take, yeah. and there was better adherence in the trial to yeah. aspirin than to ticagrelor. So it looks grossly non-inferior, but they wisely didn't make that statistical claim. And again, in real yeah. life, I I'd use the cheaper drug that's better True. tolerated, not the more expensive Michael, one that isn't. Michael, any comment to add Just from the, a the surgical short, point of view? The shorter the dual antiplatelet therapy for us, the easier it makes our <laughs> lives. So. He's a surgeon. Yes. <laughs> kind of, yeah. I think that's Predictable uh, it answer. Fits, it fits with you. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's now go into uh, two studies. Uh, the Ascend study. Uh, basically, uh, diabetes is a significant risk factor that we are told equal to have coronary artery disease. So, and the data on platelet inhibitors and specifically on aspirin has been very controversial in the literature and we don't have to go into it. But uh, in this study, the ASCENT study, it was decided to address the issue. This is a study based in the United, uh, in the United Kingdom and basically, the first one I want to present is the use of aspirin for primary prevention in persons with diabetes mellitus. Uh, Louis Bowman and Jane Armitage from Oxford were leading the study. And just let me make a long story short. Basically, we are talking about 15,000 participants who actually underwent randomization of aspirin 100 milligrams uh, versus matching placebo with a follow-up, I believe, was seven years. And they look at all possibilities, serious vascular events, and they look at bleeding. This was important. Now, in a huge study like this, any little difference makes a p-value, which is the question is, what is the impact? In fact, when you look at the vascular events, the, uh, it was 8.5% in the aspirin group versus 9.6% in the placebo group. And they call this significant, p-value 0 0.01. But you know, we have so many people and it's just one point. On the other hand, the bleeding is 3.2% mm -hmm. in the placebo group, 4.1% in the aspirin with a wash. So you end up really that the absolute benefit in one hand uh, is detrimental in the other. And, and, and this leads to an interesting question, and maybe I'm going to ask you actually, because we have learned about bleeding from the surgical side. We have learned that bleeding is important over the last 10 years, with so much in preventing ischemic events, and many of the studies actually came from, the, from you. I think this is a clear example of modern look at events, you know, bleeding versus ischemia. And, and actually, at the very end, it seems you should not give aspirin to a patient who has diabetes without evidence of cardiovascular disease. I'd like just you to comment about the history of bleeding and surgery. 
Yeah, the, the um, impact long term, there is long term impact for bleeding uh, complications of surgery. Um, and uh, a study like this is, is a little bit difficult to interpret because you have to weigh the bleeding uh, complications, the, what those mean to the patients versus the reductions in the cardiovascular outcomes, what those, how those are weighted by the patients. And um, it's a, a little bit analogous to a bioprosthetic or a mechanical aortic valve. You're, you're basically trying to ask the patient to weigh what's more important to you, a reoperation or increased bleeding risk in the future. And that's difficult. It's was major bleeding though. Yeah, it major really bleeding. Precise in the way that you describe it. Yeah. Now. It, it, it's a um, it's a real endpoint that has uh, um, uh, real consequences for the patients, and uh, therefore, I, I'm to be honest, being a surgeon, I'm glad because I don't have to <laughs> weigh in on this. But this is a real conundrum from my point of view. Yeah, Irina, what would you think? Um, I think that um, um, this observation that aspirin is great for uh, primary prevention. Uh, came first of all from appreciation that it works wonders in secondary prevention and these results were extrapolated and then uh, evidence and primary prevention we are referring to different populations higher risk probably um, different uh, management of cardiovascular risk factors which has now improved and maybe that is why the overall input impact of aspirin, adding aspirin on top of better yeah, cardiovascular risk management, uh, offset is ob its obvious positive, uh, positive effect. And I think it's very confusing for the, phys for the physicians who obviously would use for secondary prevention, who also learned about various reports that aspirin is useful, for example, to combat or to yeah. prevent colon cancer, bowel cancer. So in general, it is good for you and intuitively it's good because it thins your blood. But unfortunately, we don't get this good evidence and it's confusing. But I think that I don't know whether it's going to change our practice. I think that many physicians like to prescribe aspirin. Yes, but you know you bleed. It is interesting, doctors like aspirin. In my experience, yeah. doctors Thanks. really use aspirin yeah. for primary prevention. But you know you see bleeding, gastrointestinal bleeding. I mean, it's to prevent ischemic events, but there is the problem. Can you add any comment about this study? I, I, I would make a difference between the, you know, a patient with a con a controlled diabetes and uh, a, a patient with uncontrolled diabetes, okay. hypertension, is a good point. current smoking, yeah. Uh, and, and these patients do not bear the same risk, and, and we, we should be careful before saying there is absolutely no need for aspirin. This was very well patients. controlled diabetes. Yes. Good you, point. Yeah. You, could, a, you could have, you, could, you, you can see healthy diabetics. It's a very good point. Yeah, I guess I have a much more rosy interpretation of the trial than, than, than perhaps the, the rest of you do, and even more so than the uh, investigators uh, doing the trial and writing it up and presenting it. They presented it as a negative trial. Yes. Yeah. Honestly, if I were presenting it, I would have presented it as a positive trial. I mean, it met its primary endpoint. You're right, the absolute risk reduction was not large, but it's a primary prevention population. Even among diabetics, the event rates aren't so, so high. So it's a positive trial. Now there's bleeding, but it, we're comparing irreversible events, MI, ischemic stroke, cardiovascular death, to reversible ones, transfusions. It wasn't a significant excess yeah. in fatal or intracranial bleeding. So I guess my position would be it's an option to use this in primary prevention diabetics? Would I use it in everybody? No, I would only use it in people that I thought were at low risk of bleeding. And the other thing I might consider, not totally evidence-based, is proton pump inhibition. I mean, I think that's a question that's really ripe for investigation. Maybe yeah. if there were a concomitant proton pump inhibitor that largely attenuates the GI bleeding hazard of aspirin, and then you've got a much better net clinical benefit. Yeah. We'll talk in a moment, but uh, I must say to you that um, it's interesting you said you feel positive, I feel negative, and let me tell you why. Because the incidence rate goes from 8.5% to 9.6% in a seven year follow up. I, I would not consider this a positive trial. Yeah, it's a p value, it's positive, but 15,000 people, you know, that you're dealing with. So. Well, I don't think it's something that I would say use it in 
every diabetic No, no, but they, I understand it. But I think among yeah. the universe of diabetes, it's a lot of patients, and some are higher risk primary prevention, some are low risk. And even the terms primary and secondary prevention, they're a bit artificial. Yeah, I, I mean, agree. what if you have a diabetic patient, they excluded known atherosclerosis, but let's say you know that there's a 50% carotid stenosis, yeah. asymptomatic. Is that primary mm -hmm. prevention? Is it secondary prevention? What if someone does a coronary calcium score? Yeah. You know, then what if that's 800? Is that primary prevention in the diabetic, secondary prevention. So I just think there's now latitude with physician discretion to selectively prescribe aspirin for primary prevention in the diabetic patient. I've never believed in patients just starting it on their own for primary prevention and yeah. taking it. That I think is an error. And this trial and one that you'll soon discuss corroborate that. But with physician input, careful discussion with patients, I think okay, it's reasonable so, to consider. So the, the basic summary by listening to you is that uh, this is a complex field, whether the diabetes is well controlled or not, whether there is subclinical disease or not, and uh, there is ischemia less, a little bit less with the, with the aspirin, so it may be debatable, but uh, just uh, one point, and I only want to make one point, is that this ascent study moved into omega-3, which was given one gram, which is what has been told, looking at all the studies on fish and so forth, you should take. And I don't want to spend time. The results were absolutely negative with omega-3 in the same trial, seven years of follow-up with uh, all these numbers of patients, 15,000 uh, uh, control versus... Uh, versus the use of omega-3, which means I'm not sure what supplements mean compared with fish, and, and this is something I think we all feel the same, there's no need to discuss. All this artificial stuff that you give, uh, I'm not entirely sure they act exactly the same than when you give this in natural terms. You agree with this, Irina? Absolutely, yes, quite a fish story. Yeah about fish oil. But I think it's important because, you know, a lot of my patients might not take oh, their God. statin, but they're taking their omega-3 supplements. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> and those aren't cheap either, so... Uh, you have to spend more time in a patient to stop all the supplements yeah. and discontinue smoking these days. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's very <laughs> true. <laughs> okay, so um, let, me, let me go then into um, um, the study, the ARRIVE study. Um, very simple, uh, if you go back to the doctor's aspirin study, you know, years ago, uh, the question was aspirin for primary prevention. And what the study really showed that for primary prevention, aspirin would be justified if there is a high risk factor profile. This was basically what the study showed. Despite doctors like to take aspirin a lot. But anyway, in this study here, uh, the so-called ARRIVE study, uh, is a study uh, of uh, 12,000 patients who actually were considered to be at moderate risk uh, for cardiovascular disease. And, uh, and in terms of how they describe this uh, moderate, they had about uh, two to four risk factors uh, or conventional risk factors, and the 10-year risk was 10 to 20%. So it was moderate, high risk. And the patients were actually randomized on aspirin uh, versus placebo. And uh, just to make the long story short, no difference at all. With the rate of events was very, very low. I think we are doing so many things that it's hard to prove. There's one issue I would like to ask you, because you wrote a paper about it, which is the, the aspirin that they gave was actually quoted, enteric quoted aspirin. Do you think it works? Uh, that's a great question. And as you know, I published in Jack uh, yeah, I know. a paper that uh, the enteric coating impairs the absorption of aspirin. And I, I thought, obviously I I'm biased, but I thought it was a clever little pharmacodynamic study. But in fact, if we go back a few decades, that work had been done before. So it, it, it's known that the enteric coating does impair the pharmacokinetics, the pharmacodynamics of aspirin. Does that matter in chronic daily dosing? That's harder to say. But for sure, in the short term, over the course of a few days, it takes a while for the enteric coating to kick in. And in some patients, it never fully does. Anyway, in this study, Irina, basically, um, they look at bleeding, they look at mortality, they look at ischemia, they look at everything, no difference. Seven years of follow-up. So here's my question, going back to primary prevention yeah. that you mentioned. Uh, 
you know, aspirin is not doing too well in this uh, in this meeting. Well, we have at least at this meeting presented two uh, well conducted huge studies of primary prevention with aspirin Diabetes in various populations. Yes, I think that. Um, if we can pull all data that we know and try to find out to do this sort of like subgroup analysis and find out the settings, non-controlled, poorly controlled diabetics versus well-controlled, hypertensive at different levels, different stages, concomitant disease, we can come actually with identification, possibly, hopefully, of those settings in primary prevention that would certainly need um, aspirin. And then, if necessary, which obviously would be an ideal world, to run a randomized control study in that setting. Uh, but I think that we have enough data now to try and understand this problem. Because I would not dismiss aspirin uh, for primary prevention like that. I would say, Irina, if uh, just answering or responding to you, something is happening that is decreasing the event rates significantly. Yes. Yeah. And it's any drug, and including yeah. aspirin, I think aspirin is very is a, is a great drug, so we don't want to dismiss. But 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 the role of aspirin in primary prevention uh, has a little bit of a shake up these days, even in peripheral vascular disease and so forth. In so, overall population. So in the overall population, I think yeah. what's happening is other things are doing the job. Mm -hmm. And yes. the incidence rates are decreasing. And I think we are facing something that perhaps before aspirin was more of a protagonist. Well, there's I'll, a lot more statin use, for example. Yeah. yeah. A lot of cities have smoking bans I these think there's a change. Yeah. And I think this is why we are struggling with aspirin as a second wave. And we, it's not doing what we are supposed to or thinking should do. And I think it's times have changed a little bit. Final paper, uh, in actually, we are getting close to the time, but I just want to summarize uh, uh, the amyloid story, uh, ATTR amyloid. You know, this is the one that has nothing to do with hematological disorders. Some of these patients are acquired, uh, are, are familiar, and some are the so-called senile amyloidosis, a group that we have been very disappointed, mortalities very high, you know, over a period of five years, almost 100%. Well, this study is interesting uh, by the group at Columbia uh, Med University Medical Center, Dr. Maurer, the ATTRACT study. Um, basically, it's an international mm -hmm. study, uh, 441 patients with amyloid, uh, TTR amyloid, and they were randomized into tafamidis, which is a drug that actually interferes with the splitting of amyloid and deposition in the tissues and placebo in the follow-up over 30 months. The results were impressive. Um, uh, lower all-cause mortality, 29% in the treated group versus 42% in the control group. Um, again, uh, 30 months of follow-up, lower rate of cardiovascular hospitalization, uh, the, the, um, the, um, the, the um, declined in six-minute walk, significantly prolonged in the group that was treated like this. It's an amazing study because everything really came up positive for the drug and became significantly positive. So what I'm really asking, to me, this is the paper of the meeting, by the way. This is a personal uh, view, but I'd like to, uh, how you react to it. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very impressive. It's very effective. It reduced deaths, um, whatever the dose. Um, uh, we had absolutely no treatment for this disease. And, and, and the disease is everywhere. I mean, we discussed TAVIs. 20% yeah. of patients undergoing TAVIs have the disease, yeah. and we don't treat the disease, uh, but we, we, we implant a valve. So I think it's a new era for, for lots of patients, and uh, uh, I'm eager to get the treatment. It's exciting. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, well, the introduction of a new medication for a condition that has been poorly treated is always a very exciting use. And the size of the trial was pretty good. And the follow-up was long enough to, uh, months, dif exactly, to differentiate between the endpoints. I think it's a highly positive study and um, 
it's really well, that science that yeah. we would like to see yeah. at the uh, it's wonderful. Uh, publishing. Yeah, it reduces process. mortality, it improves yes. quality of life. Yeah, and it, every, it, every aspect was positive. Yeah, it's hard, hard and the, the one negative, yeah. though, if I can interject a negative, is the cost. Yes. That is, it, it's yeah. projected that the cost yeah. is going to be quite high. And as Jill correctly points out, once you start looking, there's a lot of amyloid out there. You know, Michael, in the, in the clinical field, we see lots of these patients you know, in the elderly population. And, and some of these patients actually have TABR. They have what appears yeah. to be LBH, aortic yeah. stenosis, and, and he's, a, he's, a real, he's a real entity. And yeah, I don't uh, obviously see these patients on a regular basis. Um, the TAVR patients we do see, but it, it's an interesting contrast to the last study. Basically, it brings to question whether the primary prevention trials are going to play a smaller role in the future as we're getting healthier and healthier and we're getting better at controlling the big things. And then we, maybe we should be focusing on the smaller problems where they're highly lethal, mm -hmm. where we have no solutions. Okay, let's finish by saying, uh, I'd like to ask each of you, uh, aside of this particular study, which I think we all feel the same, is, is probably the most striking, uh, I would like to ask from the three interventional surgical studies, all the aspirinated studies, which one has been the most interesting to you that perhaps makes you to change your practice? So I can only go off this list, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, because uh, there was a lot of great stuff presented at this meeting. Well, you know, I, I think in terms of scientific breakthroughs, really the amyloid study is the sure. big one. We are all in agreement with that. Yeah, but uh, moving beyond that, uh, I thought culprit shock was really important because there were many yeah. doctors thinking, okay, the 30-day result's too soon, let's wait a year, then the complete revask is gonna look terrific but it didn't. So that really should change practice and change our biases and say, look, for whatever reason, just go after the yeah, culprit. You make a very clear statement at the beginning, Jill. I'm biased also. I am a co-author of this paper, and uh, I mean, this is an important uh, conclusion. We have changed already our practice after the 30 days results. Yeah. Uh, and it went from don't do it, just yeah. do it, or the opposite. But. You know, it, it's it's uh, it's a real important it's one year study. follow up. Yes, yeah, with one year follow up, yeah. and uh, you know, uh, guidelines are changing. Uh, this is an important study. Uh, all the other studies, unfortunately, are negative, so it's yeah. going to be difficult to, to recommend something. Yeah. I think that I probably would say that um, uh, the uh, publication of these two large studies in aspirin opens a lot of further uh, analysis from these studies and assessing how managing cardiovascular risk in modern era affects um, the outcome and um, maybe to find out which therapies yeah. Uh, yeah. has the largest impact. I think it's just, it's great that these studies are still conducted. Yeah. We'll continue to talk about aspirin forever. <laughs> I think so. That's it probably... It seems to me, isn't it's it? Not yes. even a drug, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Michael? Um, the mitral F FR study is the one that's really going to affect uh, our practice. And I'm, I'm not saying that on a schadenfreude. It's not that we don't do the mitral clips. We do. For every, every mitral clip that's done in our center, and we do a lot of them, there's always a surgeon and a cardiologist at the table. So I have a vested interest as well to say that this is valuable therapy, but this really makes me reevaluate my opinion. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and just for the audience, uh, just to say, as we said at the beginning, this is a beautiful city, uh, the city of Munich, but you can see these people didn't see the city at all. <laughs> they were in a meeting, so that's... Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, interestingly, it's a good meeting. When you look at all these studies, I think we'll learn about each of them. And so I think it has been very positive. Well, anyway, the most positive thing as usual is you and the discussion and, and, uh, and in the friendship. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate very much that you spent one hour here this morning uh, with us. And, uh, and we wish the best to the four of you. And thank you very much for watching us. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>